اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الحمد للہ اللذی هدانا لہذا وما کننا لنحتدی لولا ان هدان اللہ والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء وسید المرسلین وشفی المذنبین سیدنا و نبینا عبی القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيت التيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وتحرهم تتهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد لا سيما مولانا وسيد صاحب الأسي والزمان روحي وعرواه العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم المنكر فذائله من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب يشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وَحَلُ لُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ كَوْلِي For the love of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, one loud salawat, please. My dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to first off begin by extending my condolences tonight as we mark the martyrdom anniversary of the two sons of Muslim ibn Aqil, Muhammad and Ibrahim. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this act of worship from us tonight and that he gives us the tawfiq to be able to visit the graves of these two young children who although were not present on the day of Ashura and who did not give their lives on that day but are still counted as we'll see tonight as the martyrs of the event of Karbala. And so we ask Allah to grant us their shafat also on the day of judgment. Ameen ya Rabbal Alameen. Before I begin with my topic for tonight, I want to continue with the ahkam, the religious rulings that we've been discussing over the last few weeks. And I want to continue tonight, inshallah, in the rulings of the Jamaat prayers, the Salatul Jamaat, because again, these are such an integral part of our community. Whenever we gather for Thursday night, for any waladat, for any event, we tend to have the Jamaat prayers. And as we mentioned at the very beginning, a few weeks ago, that in order to really benefit from that full reward, which the hadith mentions, if there are more than 10 people present, then it is literally impossible for the creations of Allah, for you and I, for the jinn, for the angels, to be able to enumerate the reward of even one rakat. But obviously that grand reward has to be, um, is only given to those really who fulfill the criteria, who are following the rules of the congregational prayer. And today I just want to mention one or two points about the actual Jamaat prayers. And that is of the, the, the sequence we can say. Now we know that when we're talking about the Jamaat prayers, it means one person, if it's a gathering of men and women, that is a man who leads. If it's only women, they can have a woman who leads their Jamaat prayer, but the rules are the same for both of the genders. We know that when it comes to the initiation, we start the Salat with the Takbir to Ihram, by raising our hands, parallel to our ears, which is mustahab, and to say Allahu Akbar. This begins the prayers. Obviously, we all know and recognize this fact. But the point I want to mention today is when we look at, look at the Jamaat prayers, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we do not begin the takbir to ihram before the imam of the Jamaat. Because obviously, we are following the person who is leading in the prayers. And if we are to begin before him or her, in the case of the sisters who might have their own congregational prayer, this actually has the potential to nullify our prayer because we have begun before the actual prayer has started. So one of the things just to keep in mind is that for the takbir to ihram, it is imperative, it's very important to make sure that we wait until the imam of the jamaat begins and then we follow after him or her. The second point are all of the actions in the prayer. So we have the recitation of the two surahs, we have the ruku, we have the sajda, the kunut, the, the tashahud, the, the salam, all of these other parts of the prayer. And even in these actions, we need to make sure that we're either performing them at the same time of the imam of the jamaat or slightly thereafter. A lot of times we may inadvertently go into ruku or sajda before the imam of the jamaat. If this is done unintentionally, it's not a problem. Unintentional going into an action before the imam is not a problem, but the problem comes if we do it intentionally. If intentionally we are doing these actions, they actually will nullify our jamaat prayer. And if you have a nullified jamaat prayer, you need to obviously change your intention to a furada prayer to make your prayers count. 
But obviously that will cause you trouble because you now have to recite everything on your own. And if you're in the fir- front line, you then end up perhaps rendering everybody else's connection. If you are a connecting person, you end up rendering their prayers also null and void. If they don't realize that you have switched to the furada intention, leaving the jamaat. So if it's done unintentionally, it's acceptable by Allah. There's no problem, but we need to make sure that we don't develop a habit. So it's best to wait as the imam is doing the dhikr and he finishes it or she finishes it to give that person a few seconds or a second to go into the position and then you follow along. And similarly when they come out of the ruku or sajda you wait a second and then you move into that next position. Another question and I'll end with this of the ahkam section is what about the dhikr? What if I go into ruku at the same time of the imam or at the proper time but my dhikr is shorter than his or hers. What if I just said subhanAllah three times and the prayer leader is doing a longer dhikr and my, I finish earlier? In that case, our scholars say there's no problem if your dhikr com- is completed before the imam of the jamaat, but don't come out of that position. So you can repeat your dhikr again or you can remain silent if maybe it'll finish within a second or two. Um, so, fin- to, so to finish a dhikr earlier is not a problem, but to go into the action or come out of it is problematic. It can affect your jamaat prayers, it can affect your prayers in general, and ultimately it may also impact those who are around you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to learn the rules of the prayers and that we are able to fulfill our obligations to Allah in the way that He has deemed us to be those who follow the rules of the salat. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As you mentioned tonight, we've gathered together to mark the martyrdom of two young men, Muhammad and Ibrahim, who were the children of Muslim ibn Aqil. And I want to look at the topic tonight, look briefly about them, but also under the topic of how to deal with our children. Because these two young men, who were under 15 years of age, they, are, they should become role models for our children. You know, when you look at their family tree, their mother and their father weren't masoom. You know, sometimes people have this thought, well, how do I follow Imam Hassan and Hussein salam as children? They're masoom. Their mother was masooma, their father was masoom, their grandfather was infallible, their entire lineage had purity built into them. And so sometimes we think, well, we can't use those members of the family of the Prophet as a role model because we are prone to error, we're prone to making mistakes, we have our passions and our desires which get to us. And so we just brush that off as an impossible life to lead. But when we come down the family of the Prophet and we look at other members as we look at tonight these two young men, with the Masumin in terms of their family and their, uh, you know, being in their company. And but yet we see that even though these two young men were of a young age when they left this world, but still they had something within them that caused them to be able to willingly give up their lives for the imam of their time and for a mission and for a cause which they found to be valuable for their own uh, time of understanding. And so tonight I want to look at a few hadith on this topic of how to deal with our children. But before I go to Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. One more salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Please. Before I go more into their lives, let me just look at briefly who these young men are, so we have a better understanding of their family, the lineage where they come from. So at the very top of the family tree, we have Abu Talib and his wife Fatima bint Asad They have four sons, obviously Imam Ali Jafar, who we know, uh, know as Jafar al-Tayyar, we have Aqil and we have Talib. And there are also two sisters, so Imam Ali and the brothers also have two sisters, Fakhita and Jumana. I won't look at those other families, the, the other children and spouses, but we see from Imam Ali salam, obviously Imam Hussein is one of his sons. And from Aqil, he has multiple children, one of them is Muslim. 
So that makes Imam Hussein and Muslim ibn Aqil to be first cousins. First cousins at that level. And then Muslim, obviously, he marries, he has children. And the two children, obviously, are killed on the day of Ashura. And two other ones are Muhammad and Ibrahim. And so they become, in English, what we call first cousins once removed. Meaning that they are the children of Imam Hussein's first cousin. So this just gives us a background of their family, where they come from. And obviously, each of these members of the family of Hazrat Abu Talib, we know them to be very brave, valiant individuals. Obviously, Amir al-Mu'mineen, his biography is in, in no need for us to explain tonight. We know him as you know, the hero of the battles of the time of early Islam, and even after when he accepted, or he was given the Khilafat, this open Khilafat. Jafar al-Tayyar, I mean, even his title, al-Tayyar, the Prophet said that he lost both of his arms in a battle, but the Prophet said that he was given two wings to fly in paradise, and therefore we call him Jafar al-Tayyar, the one with wings. So obviously that is a, a huge uh, accolade for Jafar right there, to be given that title by Rasulullah. Aqil, obviously also we know that there are a lot of historical events about him, and we know his relationship to Imam Ali alayhi salam, and maybe the other three, there's not much known about these individuals within our, uh, our understanding, but ultimately all of these come from this family of bravery, of valor, of giving themselves up for a cause which they believe in. So Muhammad and Ibrahim, the two young martyrs that we're marking tonight, they come from such a family where they are really surrounded by bravery, by, by honor, by valor, and those who are again ready to sacrifice their lives for their imam of their time. Now as I mentioned that they don't play a direct role in Karbala, meaning that they weren't killed on the day of Ashura. There are different interpretations, different historical narrations of what happened to them. How did they end up um, in, the, in the dungeon of Ibn Ziyad in Kufa? And how did they end up being shaheed about 50 or 60 kilometers away from Karbala? And inshallah, we'll look at that also briefly tonight. But, also, but we do see that their role was instrumental, that they were uh, two young men who were, you know, didn't just give up when the, when the going got tough. They were still on the pursuit. They were still trying to make something. They were still trying to do something for the cause of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. That they were on the, on the move, on the go within, uh, within where they were encaptured. And obviously, ultimately, they meet their own shahadat due to the political situations and the, own, and the situation that they found themselves in. So we don't underestimate them just because they weren't killed on the day of Ashura, but still their message obviously should resonate with us and it should be something that can also bring us inspiration. Just to give you also a background of where they're buried, so especially if you haven't been to Iraq and you haven't seen the geography, they were killed ultimately near the Farat River and obviously their bodies were thrown into the river according to the traditions and the man who killed them, Harith, he obviously takes their heads to the governor and he you know, expects his reward from the governor. And so they are ultimately are buried near to the Furat, about 45 or 50 kilometers away from Karbala. So obviously after Ashura from Karbala, they had made their way through the desert, through the jungles of that region, and ended up you know, in, 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 a, in a woman's house where they sought shelter and protection. And then ultimately they fled from there and they were eventually murdered, martyred, and they are buried now in a site called Musayib, which is about, again, 50 kilometers from the city of Karbala in present day. So they did a lot of traveling as two young men to try to really get away from the situation that they were in. Tonight the topic I want to look at is about our children and how, for example, we see in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt salam that we have been instructed to bring up our children. You know, when you look in the ayat of the Qur'an, Allah gives us a lot of indications about upbringing of children. We have the story, for example, of, of Luqman and how he talks to his son. In fact, Luqman, not even being a prophet, he's given an entire chapter of the Qur'an named after him. And there are a lot of different lessons in Surah Luqman for parents who are trying to bring up children. We also have examples of Prophet Ibrahim and his family and Prophet Musa and the challenges that he went through within his family. And so a lot of these different examples we have, we can also couple them with hadith that we have from the Prophet and from the Imams salam, where they give us also guidance and guidelines on how to bring up our children. 
and obviously living in an era that we are living in today, where things are not as easy as they perhaps were 20, 25 years ago, where influences are more within the society, where parents are so busy that they don't have time sometimes to come to the centers. When all of these challenges are there, we need to look towards the guidance of Ali Muhammad to see what kind of inspiration they have given us so that we can perhaps bring up our children in the footsteps of Muhammad and Ibrahim and many other great young men and young women of the early history of Islam that they can be ready to sacrifice their life, their wealth, their time, their energies for the cause of Islam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now all of these hadith, and three hadith I want to look at tonight, are going to focus solely on the parents. Because obviously they are the primary caregivers in the family, they are the primary educators of the children in their family. And so we need to ensure that the parents are equipped with the knowledge of Islam to be able to really bring up their children in these positive ways. And so the first hadith that we want to look at tonight is in terms of respect of the mother of your children. So what does the Qur'an, or what, rather what do the hadith say about respecting the mother? Right? We know from one angle that the hadith tells us that Jannat lies under the feet of the mother. The Prophet has clearly said that paradise lies under the feet of your mother. So if a young man or young woman wants to attain paradise, they need to make sure that they are pleasing, to respect, to honor, to love their, their mother especially. But at the same time, we see in this hadith which we'll share with, that the family also has to realize the worth of the mother. And this, where, this is where it comes to the role of the father in respecting the mother, especially when they are within the company of the children. So the first hadith we have, which comes from one of the infallibles, they mention to us that the right of the child over his father, there's multiple in the hadith, I just chosen the one, is that the father respects his child's mother. So, you know, there are obviously times when we have in our life that a husband and wife may have disagreements, they may have arguments, they may have fights. But we have to appreciate the fact that the children should not be caught up in that whirlwind within the house. That if the spouses have issues, that they should not let that affect the way that they interact with the children. And especially the hadith, as it mentions, and our scholars mention, that the father should respect the mother in, in, in the presence of the children. Because if they see that the father is disrespecting the mother, maybe he's using abusive language, maybe, God forbid, he's being physically abusive, or he's not being a nice person to the mother, then this actually can have and would have an impact on the children. And it's, as the, as the hadith says, it's actually a right of the children that their father respects the mother. And obviously this would take different forms within the family, and the way that issues are dealt with within the family would be unique in every circumstance and, and situation. But ultimately, this is the point that, as the hadith mentions, that that respect has to be within, that, within the family setting. Because if that respect is destroyed, then obviously the children will see, well, my father, who is this authority figure in the family, he's not respecting you know, my mom, so why should I respect her? And obviously that has the potential to make the situation much worse within the family setting. And so therefore, the, one of the first things we see is the respect within the family. And not just for the father, but also on the other side, that the wife also has to reciprocate. She should also be respecting the father of her children. She shouldn't use abusive language or be harsh or critical, or use any of these things that in any way would lessen the children's understanding or love or affection or appreciation that, that they have with the father. So it goes both ways, the father respecting the mother and also the mother respecting the father in the presence of the children. The second hadith we have looks at two of the most vulnerable groups within our communities and within our societies, the seniors and the children. Because when you look at our religious events, for the most part, the average age or you know the main age of the community they are pretty much taken care of yes for the madrasa we have you know we have the children who are taken care of in the madrasa but at a, at a higher level when we look at our societies and our you know muslim community is no exception to this rule we see that when it comes to young children they're in a the daycare they're in you know in some home care 
And the seniors, unfortunately, we also relegate them to the seniors' homes. Maybe not this community or Muslims in general, but we do see this in our societies, that we have senior citizens' homes. And when the, when the parents get to a certain age, the children, they're too busy with work and, and with their own activities and vacationing, that they don't have time for their parents. And so they ship them off to be taken care of by other people. This is also a problem that we have within our societies. Both of the extremes, both the children and also the seniors, that many times that they're not taken care of, their needs are not met within a religious setting. In a hadith we have which speaks about this tells us the following, that a, that, that person is not from amongst us, the Ahlul Bayt, who does not show compassion to our young ones and does not respect our seniors. So these are two groups that we really have to, as a community, think about. Because ultimately, if, unless we die in an accident, most, you know, especially living in North America, most chances that we will live to be senior citizens. We will live to be maybe 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And here the Hadith is telling us that if we don't respect our elders, our seniors, and show compassion to the young ones, then the Prophet says we're not actually from their set of teachings. And we just look at our, our communities today. You know, when it comes to these sorts of majalis and gatherings that we have, we sometimes try to impose too much on the children. We'll have young children, four, five, six, seven years old, and we expect them to sit for an entire program. You know, we'll have, for example, Hadith Kisa or Surah Yasin for 20 minutes, and we expect our children to sit beside us quietly for that whole time. And then Dua Kamel will come, and they'll get a bit fidgety, and they'll, you know, they'll want to run around. And we'll say, no, you have to sit down for another half an hour. And then the dua will finish, and then the majlis starts. And then this person will speak for 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour. And the child is getting fidgety, obviously, because they're young. And so we expect them to sit for two hours in a program and not move a muscle. But yet we look at ourselves and the elders, not here, but maybe in other communities, and the program gets a bit too long and people's cell phones start coming out. They start maybe texting their spouse or playing a game on their phone or they just come, can get up and walk out of the hall. And so we as adults get tired sitting for even an hour, an hour and a half, and yet we expect our children to be quiet and just sitting with us, listening to everything, even though they might not understand a lot of what they're hearing. And sometimes you'll see in certain communities that people will scold the children They'll maybe hit them, they'll force them to sit down, they'll be rude to the children. And this is something that we have to get away from because their children at the end of the day, their whole focus in life is to play, is to enjoy that, that early formative years. Yes, there should be discipline within our centers. I'm not saying that the hall becomes a, a playground where children climb and run around and, and, and make noise. No, but there has to be a sense where children have that understand that they can come to the center, they have some time to burn off their energy. Maybe to have separate programs for children where they can learn at their pace, uh, you know, things that they can also take in at their level, and let the adults enjoy the main program, and then let them come up with their parents, and then mingle with, with one another. But we have to come up with some solution that we have compassion, we have love for our children, not that we force them to come, and then we make them sit for hours on end, and they get just completely bored and disenchanted with the centers. And then when we look around, we see when they come 16, 17, 18, they're no longer in the masjid. And we ask ourselves, what happened? We gave them everything they wanted and now they're not here. Well, we need to look at what we did in the beginning, in the formative years when they were coming to the programs. Did we instill the love in the programs for them to come? Or did we make it like an army boot camp, that they couldn't move, they couldn't do anything, that they were glued to their seat? And obviously at the other end are the seniors. And we see that many of our Shia communities, even in North America, they have established a seniors advisory board. They have outings, they go to you know, vacation spots, they'll have religious gatherings, they'll have times when they can go out of town, go for dinner, and just meet with one another. Because obviously when you get to that age, you know, maybe many of your friends are passing away, maybe they're moving out to other parts of the world. And so that is also a, a demographic that we have to seriously think about. Again, all of us will become seniors at one time or another. And if we're not thinking about our seniors today, then what will happen when we become of that age? 
You know, there's some communities that I've been to, and they have a row of chairs at the back of the hall for people who can't sit on the floor. Most of the seniors sit back there. And one of the communities I went to, they refer to that area as the waiting lounge, or as the departure lounge. I think, I think you get what I mean as the departure lounge. And we laugh about it because it's sort of cute, but it's also disrespectful in a way if we think about it. You know, it's like we're just waiting for them to leave, and so somebody else can vacate, you know, they can, somebody else can take that chair. It's a reality. People use these kind of jokes, and, and it may be cute, but obviously we need to respect, as, as the hadith says, that we're not considered to be from the prophet and his teachings if we don't respect our seniors, if we don't give the compassion and love to our children, not our children, meaning my blood child, but our community on a whole, because I should consider any young boy or girl in this center to be my child, just as I, was, I would consider anybody in this community to be able to reprimand my daughter if she was, you know, being excessive in whatever she was doing, and I wouldn't take it, you know, in a bad way or in a negative way. We should also be willing as parents to allow other people, obviously within those limits of Islam, to give some discipline to our children, to ask them to sit down, to be quiet, to put away their smartphone or their tablet or their games if they're making excessive noise within the program and people are not able to focus and concentrate. And the third and final hadith we'll share with us tonight is being fair and just with our children. And obviously when we have more than one child, this is where this issue comes into play, that we need to be fair and just with them. And many times we think about being fair is if I buy one of my children a new game for their PlayStation, then I have to buy another, I have to buy my other child a game also. Or if my daughter gets whatever I buy for her, then the other child also has to get something of equal value. Well, yes, from one perspective in Islam, that is the case. If I'm going to buy my son something or my daughter something and I have other children, I need to make sure I'm fair to all of them. So if one gets a new outfit, then another one should also get something new. If somebody, one of them gets a new game, then either there can be a compromise, they can split it 50-50, or there should be some you know, compensation also for that child. But in the hadith that we see, we also learn that fairness and justice with our children isn't just for material things. You know, we can buy anything for our children that we want today. We can walk into any store and buy anything that they're really, their hearts desire. But one of the things that, and this is what we want to share in the next hadith from the Prophet, is a beautiful story where the hadith says that the Prophet was looking towards a man, one of his companions. And this man had two daughters. And the hadith says that the man kissed one of his daughters, showed her some love and affection, but he ignored the other daughter. And the prophet said that, why have you not been fair to both of them? Why have you not been fair to both of your children? So yes, we can be fair in terms of materialism, buy them clothing or toys or games or take them on vacation, but also when we show love to our children or our grandchildren, we have to be equal. If we have multiple grandchildren, we give one a gift on Eid or their birthday, and we ignore the other one, this is something that we should think about, because the Prophet is clearly showing to this man, who was a companion of the Prophet, that why weren't you fair? You give love and affection to one of your daughters and you ignore the other one? This is something that we have to be really careful about. We might think it to be something maybe trivial, not so important to worry about, but I think all of these traditions and so many, maybe thousands of hadith we have from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt wasalam, on bringing up children, all of these were, were spoken for a reason. The Prophet knows the psyche of the human being. He knows how children think, how, what makes them tick, what makes them react, what brings them closer to their parents and their grandparents and their family, and also what brings them further away. So we even have traditions which talk about when you make a promise to your children, fulfill that promise. Don't just promise them something to get them off your backs. You know, sometimes we as parents might do this, that we're driving in the car and the children are making noise, they're, you know, just being very active in the back seat. And to keep them quiet, we'll tell them, we'll take you to the mall, or we'll take you to get some, you know, go to a, some fast food restaurant for something. We don't mean it, but just to keep them a bit quiet in the back seat, we make them these false promises. And then what happens, the father or mother, maybe they forget intentionally, or something happens and then the kids ask, well, what happened, dad? You said, we're gonna go and get an ice cream cone. 
and you always had in your mind that you didn't want to take them, but you just said it to keep them quiet. So the hadith tells us that when you make a promise to your children, fulfill it because they see the parents as the razik, as the sustainer, as the nourisher. And they don't realize that, you know, that they, they just see a promise being made to them. It's part of their fitra, their human nature, that they don't understand the concept of a lie. A lie is what we teach our children as they get older. So when we make a promise, the hadith says, fulfill it. Just as when Allah makes us promises, we expect Allah to keep His word. We should also be the same with our family, with our children especially, that when we make them a promise, be ones who honor it, who fulfill our words to our children. As the Prophet says that we need to instill all of these things within our children and many more other traditions that we have, but we won't mention them tonight. If we expect our children to be at the level of the children, for example, of Hazrat Muslim ibn Aqil, or even the children of Imam Hassan on the day of Ashura, or even the children of Sayyid al-Shuhada, who gave their lives up on the day of Ashura. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> and tonight we're marking the martyrdom of two of these young men who gave up their lives on the, on the path of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Again, Ibrahim and Muhammad were young men of maybe 10, 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age. Ibrahim being the older of the two siblings. The historians, they differ a lot in the account of the shahadat, of the martyrdom of these two young men. But the general narrative that we've probably heard and we've read in many of the books of the event of Karbala mentions that a point came when these two young men were somehow caught in the city of Kufa. They were in the city of Kufa after the day of Ashura. Obviously, they were not shaheed on, in, the, in the event of Karbala. But they eventually were found out. They had made their way to a home of a lady, according to one of the narrations. And she realized who they were, that these were children from the family of the Prophet. And so she agreed to take them into her care. But she also knew at the same time that the situation was tense because this was after the event of Ashura. And so obviously, those who were connected to the family of the Prophet, they were always being on the hunt and they were being looked after by the government. So eventually these two young men, they had been captured. They had spent, according to the narrations, about one year in prison, in the prison of Ibn Ziyad. And the, the narrations mentioned that a point came when these two young boys, when one day the, the guard came, and he was an old, gentle man. And they thought that maybe if we talk to this old man, maybe he will let us go free. Just maybe he'll hear of our plight, of our story, of our family lineage, and that he let us go free, and maybe we can make it to safety. So one night when he brings them the bread and water, which was their regular meal every night in the prison, they, give, they tell this man the story that they have been going through. Out of sympathy, out of compassion for these two young children, the man lets them out of the prison. But obviously, where can they go when there's such a tense situation? The event of Karbala had transpired, according to the narrations, a year before their own martyrdom. And still, the, the situation was tense within that, within that region. Eventually, finally, they make their way to the house of a woman. They make their way to the house of this lady who was a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. But she also realizes at the same time that, yes, she wants to take them in, but that her son, or rather her son-in-law, Harith, He's one of the government agents, and he, if he was to find them in the house, that he would definitely take, and get, take, take them to the to governor to get his reward. The historians mention that at one point he comes home, he comes to the house of his mother-in-law, and he asks to spend the night there, and he spends the night. And sometime in the middle of the night, he hears the sound of crying of two young boys. He goes to the house in the darkness of the night. He finally gets into the room where Muhammad and Ibrahim are kept. He gets into the room and he asks them, who are you? These two young boys say that, would you please give us a promise? If, you tell us, if we tell you who we are, that you'll give us protection. And he makes the promises one after the other after the other. Eventually, after they tell, them the, they tell him the entire story, he goes back on his word. He goes back on his word and he says, I'm going to take you and kill you and get my reward from Ibn Ziyad. Next morning he goes with his slave towards the river Furat. He, tells, he gives his slave his sword. He says, cut off the heads of these two young boys. The slave begins to talk to Muhammad and Ibrahim. The slave realizes who these two young boys are and he throws himself into the river. 
At that point, this man Harith, his son, is also there. He tells his son that you now kill these two young boys and let us go and get a reward from the king. He also finds out that these two young children are the sons of Muslim ibn Aqil from the family of Rasul. He also throws the sword away and jumps himself, get, puts himself into the river Furat. At this point, Harith realizes that he himself will do this deed. We're told that he kills these two young boys and that he makes his way to the palace of Ibn Ziyad to show him these trophies that he brings. Historians mention that rather than Ibn Ziyad giving him wealth and bestowing blessings upon him, he actually orders him to be killed in the same way that he had killed these two young children. This man Harith also meets the same fate in that same way as, as it is justice that, that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ذَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Ya Allah, we ask you bihaqi Muhammad wa Ali wa Fatima wa Hassan wa Hussein and these two young children of Muslim ibn Aqil whose shahada we mark tonight that you accept this act of worship from us this evening. Ya Allah, we ask you to hasten the zuhur of our 12th Imam and that we can increase our piety and faith such that we can be worthy of being amongst the soldiers and assistants of our 12th Imam. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد